guys, I'm Dr. Kim Sage, and this video is about how to spot the nine traits of borderline PD in your mom. Now, the reason why I'm making it so specific, because there are some great videos on YouTube describing BPD, is that I truly believe that this disorder is very much underdiagnosed, and that many people grew up with moms and dads, but I'm gonna focus on moms today, with this disorder, and because borderlines can be very loving and engaging and relationally driven, there can be what I call good love, good connection at times. There can be what I call um, being in the light with the borderline that can feel really good. And so oftentimes it doesn't seem like, well, they were crazy or they were challenging or they were difficult, but they don't really meet the criteria for narcissistic PD, you know, completely. And of course we can have BPD traits and not have the disorder and that's very common as well. But I want you to understand that having a parent and being raised like this often means, especially if you were raised by an untreated borderline parent who was supposed to be your primary caregiver, there's a specific way that this impacts you, and I'm making videos on those issues, about how you see the world, how you engage in relationships. Let's assume you don't also have BPD, but when you're raised by a parent who often has the qualities, what we often think of as disorganized attachment behaviors, even if you don't manifest those and you really survive it pretty well and intact, um, you're going to have some ways of experiencing yourself and others. And so I want to make a video on what I believe BPD looks like in a mom. And the label, the stigma don't matter. Those that have this disorder have their own deep struggles and I don't want to add more to that. But we have to understand that many of them actually came from their own BPD childhoods with parents, but also that there's a specific impact when you have a parent who struggles with emotions and mood regulation, with relationships, with being impulsive, with identity and other things. But the core of that sort of issue around mood instability and relationship instability can be very toxic and catastrophic for a child. And at the core of BPD, we often see devaluation and idealization, right? That's that splitting that I love you, I hate you, you're the good child, you're the bad child. And that is really a mind screw to grow up with because it wasn't always all bad. The problem is oftentimes when you look at the whole picture collectively, the bad does outweigh the good. And that can make it, you know, um, feel shameful and you can feel guilty and responsible for them and it can be really hard and you can be stuck in that mama trauma I talked about in this video. So this applies obviously to mama trauma, to narcissistic parents and all kinds of emotionally immature parents, but there is a specific cluster of responses that occur in those of us who have BPD parents and so I wanted to share with you how to spot the signs in terms of the clinical diagnosis and what it might look like in real life. But before I do, I'm Dr. Kim Sage. As I said, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and I hope you'll consider subscribing and clicking the bell, and that way you'll get notified when I post new videos. Please also feel free to share your own stories if you feel safe to do so. I truly believe it helps us all know we're not alone, and that it wasn't just in your head that there is something about this that is worthy of being honored and validated. All right, so there are nine criteria required to make the sort of official diagnosis of BPD. It can be a very difficult disorder to diagnose. It has been historically very stigmatized and mislabeled. And as I look back on my own clinical training, I always thought of it as this sort of elusive, you know, extreme end of behavior, which it can be. But because I think we have this sort of unfair stigma, it doesn't help clinicians understand it and diagnose it and therefore provide appropriate and proper treatments. And today, there are some very good treatments for BPD. But if you're watching this as a child of BPD uh, parent, it is not your job to get your parent to treatment. You can provide information and share and encourage, but please know it is not your responsibility to, to also take care of their treatment um, as an adult. Because m the reality is if you had a parent like this, you are probably still struggling with the ways that this parent's struggles have impacted your own struggles. So let's get started. As I said, there are nine possible um, criteria options. You must meet five to have a clinical diagnosis. You want to make sure that the person creating the diagnosis understands this disorder, is well-trained. Also understand there's a lot of comorbidity around other, you know, 
you know, issues like depression, anxiety, trauma, and so all those things can make it difficult. But there's a certain sort of formation of BPD that we see, and as I said before, it goes back to that sort of devaluation, idealization, um, mood instability, relational instability, identity disturbance, impulsivity, and those, um, and a few more I'm gonna discuss, all right? So the first one is, the fear of abandonment is very much the core of BPD, that's number one. And this can be real or perceived abandonment. And when I say abandonment, I mean that everything from the littlest slight to you didn't open a gift of hers on time the way she wanted, to you actually leaving the room, to you not calling her back, to you not responding to a text message, to you not thinking she's the greatest mother ever and, and reassuring her of that in a moment when she felt insecure or unsafe. And so abandonment really is really everything from emotional abandonment to relational, to psychological, mental, or physical. And that really is one thing that differentiates BPD among all others. Now, as an adult, it can manifest in your BPD mom because of her fear of abandonment has created a very unhealthy relationship with you. You're her best friend. You're supposed to be her caretaker. You're supposed to take care of her. You're responsible for her. And because if you've been the person she's chosen to be the person to not leave her, then you often feel a great dependence upon her too. You might have this love-hate, like I can't live with her, I can't live without her. But that fear of abandonment will drive everything she says and does because at the core, her greatest fear is you or someone she loves or close to leaving her. And so she overreads that in anything and everything, especially if she's untreated and not taught the skills how to navigate that. Number two is unstable and intense relationships. This is that roller coaster dynamic where you never know what you're gonna get. She has loving good relationships and very unstable chaotic relationships. And as a child, it can mean that you know, one minute ago she was super happy with you and now your relationship is strained and not good and you are the bad child or, you know, you might be rejected because um, she's in a bad place emotionally and your relationship doesn't feel safe and consistent. She has a hard time attuning and being safe and secure with herself. Therefore, she has a hard time being safe and secure with you. And so you can feel like you're close to your mom. Your mom doesn't like you anymore. That relational instability will always be there from the time you're a child all the way through adulthood if she remains, if she remains untreated. The next one is identity disturbance. And the way this looks like as a kid is that your mom never really knows who she is, right? She might change her clothes, her hair color, her wardrobe, her job. She has a sort of vacant sense of self that she's always looking to fill up. And so you might see her go through several iterations of who she really is. And so that can, like I said, it can, it can just continually change. The next thing we see is number four is impulsivity. And this is a big part of the, um, of the BPD brain, I believe, that it's like that executive function, as we know, is often limited. And so they have a feeling, they feel rejected, the impulse to act on it is so quick that they don't even have time to sit back and think about it. And so you might see a parent who impulsively um, is upset with you, so they rip your paper in half. They might tear down your bedroom. They might um, lose control emotionally, right? But that impulsivity makes them act out in ways where you don't really know what you're gonna get, and it can happen very quickly and very unexpectedly. Number five, in terms of the criteria, is recurrent suicidal behavior, suicidal thoughts or ideations, and this can really vary from actual suicide attempts to threats of suicide, to engaging in self-harm. It can be a parent who threatened they were gonna kill themselves but then didn't, who actually tried several times. There's a pretty high rate of a, a suicide attempts with BPD. And so, as a child, you may have actually seen a parent attempt suicide or threaten suicide or talk about suicide in a way that wasn't meant to just, um, of course, it may have been in an effort to sort of not have you leave them. It could have been manipulative, but it's also because they really feel in those moments so out of control, so wounded, that that seems like a good option and the moment, and that's why it can be so dangerous. Number six is what we call effective instability, right? So it's basically mood instability. Their moods are all over the place, and they can change minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour. And this is important because it often gets confused with bipolar. 
But with bipolar, we can see more like days at a time of a certain, you know, behavioral mood combination. Whereas with BPD, we really can see it like you were guys, you know, you were at, at the breakfast table and you guys were good. And then five minutes later, she's blown up and destroyed the kitchen and she's raging at you and at your dad or her partner or other siblings. And it is just like that all the time. You never know when she's going to be in a mood. She might be crying. She might be anxious. She might be sad. She might be rageful. But you are going to see a lot of... um of unpredictability and mood instability, which is, as I said at the beginning, is a huge part of this. And so if you were like, yeah, my mom was like all over the place, like I just never knew what mood she was gonna be in, that can be a part of this disorder. Number seven is feeling empty. That's why I was saying they often have this sort of, um, you know, this sort of emptiness inside that can never be filled. And as a child, it might look like, you know, you never really know how to fill their needs. They often show themselves to be listless and unhappy and not fulfilled, and it's never enough. And you might feel like you're never enough because you can't fill her up. You can't give her what she needs. And you should just know that that is often driven by their own deep well of emptiness inside and their search to fill that. And yet, because they often get in their own way, you know, that creates more emptiness um, as a result. The next one, number eight, is inappropriate displays of anger and rage. And I would say that this is another one of the big hallmarks of BPD, is that they blow, and when they blow, they are scary. They are rageful. They, you can be afraid of them. In fact, many of those, many kids who have BPD parents will say, I was terrified of her as a kid, and I'm still terrified of her. Like, when she really loses it, her face gets red, she screams, she yells, their, um, their brain basically loses the ability to navigate zero to 60, and so they just hit 60. And when they do, there's often a take no prisoners dynamic, and it can be really scary and really dangerous, especially if it manifests in some sort of loss of control of their physical self, emotional self, psychological self, especially if that's directed towards you even if it wasn't directed towards you and you witnessed it, right, that continual exposure to rage and anger is a huge part of BPD and something you will definitely see as you look back on your childhood. Now, as a result of that, they can often feel remorseful later and then they feel bad about themselves, right? So they get stuck in that loop. And I wouldn't say they're always remorseful. They often have a hard time you know, owning their behavior, although some will. Some will apologize so that you won't leave them. And so, because they often also have poor self-awareness and poor self-insight, it can be hard for them to see that their behavior was out of control, wasn't justified, was scary. So you may get an apology or remorse later. They might feel bad inside but never express it, but then they feel bad about themselves and they act that out again and or they never really do own it because in those moments they were justified because you made them angry. But you will definitely see some form of anger and probably a lack of it improving or getting better if it's untreated um, in a BPD parent and mom. And the last one is stress-induced sort of psychosis, dissociation, and it really is that stress-induced. I think it's that fear of abandonment, that emotional chaos, the roller coaster, some relational issue, that sense of self that's so disturbed that they can, you know, go into sort of a childlike um, dissociation or kind of look like psychosis in some way. They often will tell you that they have um, psychic abilities and they're connecting to that. But the core, what really triggers that is that deep um, sense of self that gets so wounded, those emotional triggers, those difficulties in navigating their, their brain's um, capacity for dealing with emotional disruptions and fear of being left and wounded. And so that kind of manifests into this, like I'm saying, it looks like a dissociation, but really, or a psychosis, but really it is the core of all those other things that I just discussed that, that feed it in terms of borderline. So I hope that if you watch this and you've been thinking, well, is this really my mom or not? Of course, you can't make a diagnosis. I can't make one, but having someone get referred to a proper clinician would be a great place to start. As I said, it is not your responsibility, but if the person's open to treatment, and many times borderlines are, um, that they can get that support they need. There are some great therapies like DBT and others that can really help them. But remember, like I keep saying, it is not your job to help them. But I hope this description, as you watch it sometimes, I think it can be like, it can seem so extreme. But when you think about my mom, yeah, my mom raged a lot. Yeah, she kept changing who she was a lot. Yeah, she never could keep a relationship with me or anybody else. Yes, I felt parentified. I was always in charge or I was her best friend. And 
it felt like a boundary violation or she wouldn't respect my boundaries. Uh, or when I went through adolescence and I pushed back, she couldn't handle it and it combined with everything else I just discussed. If it helps you understand that you need to get support and treatment because there's a specific impact on you with a parent like this, this is where I hope it helps, right? Not to label or stigmatize or make worse, but to just make sense so that we can begin to get the healing and validation that we need. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Please stay safe and well, and um, don't forget to subscribe. And I really appreciate your posting and sharing your stories if you feel safe to do so. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye, guys.